As you know, over the last couple of weeks, we've been discussing the Annunciation, and we've considered the variety of expressions that Mary uses, the phases that she goes through in response to Gabriel's message of God's proposal to her. She first reacts in fear and surprise at his appearance and the nature of his message. Then she goes into a phase of pondering and reflecting on what it might mean. And then she questions the angel. How is this going to be? And then finally, after she's pondered, questioned, and so forth, she humbly, and we've seen the expression, accepts the proposal. And that's when the incarnation happens. And the painters have depicted it in a variety of ways. We saw how the painters of the Italian Renaissance employed their understanding, their new understanding, of perfect mathematical lineal perspective, uh, parallel lines receding into a single point in space, to create a kind of sacred third dimension in their work. And that was the mysterious space where the incarnation took place. And we, this is kind of the apex of that. The, the altarpiece by Piero della Francesca, where you can see the columns receding into infinity to that marble plaque. You see the geometry of it, the classical tradition being reborn, and the incarnation happening at a mysterious point way out there. The space between the angel and Mary is just as important, if not more so, than the two principal figures, because that's where the action is, right below the dove. So the Italians use their love of perfect proportions, their inheritance from the classical tradition, to depict the Annunciation. But we're going to see a very, very different aesthetic today, that of the northern school, the countries that we now know as Belgium and France and the Netherlands, they were going through their own kind of renaissance or artistic and theological revolution. In the medieval times, uh, theology weighed very heavily on the world of the spirit as opposed to the world of the flesh. The material world was seen as kind of abased. And so the imagination was supposed to be directed on high to things transcendent. But in the new theology, there was much more emphasis on this material world, on God's creation, and the goodness in each detail of it, in the human beings, the plants, the animals. And so the artists took great joy in observing very precisely and depicting as clearly as they could the elements of this world. That was their way of entering into the beauty of the incarnation and uh, their way of kind of capturing God, a bit of divinity in this world. So each thing becomes almost a pointer to God, a symbol, but captured in a very, very realistic way. At the same time, um, two things were happening. They were becoming increasingly wealthy with trade and new banking techniques. So there were trade routes established throughout Europe. Bruges in Belgium became a financial capital. And this new merchant class wanted to manifest its wealth and therefore began paying artists to create altarpieces that would have them in them on the sides or their name attached. Uh, secondly, they developed the technique of oil painting, of oil-based paint. And it's through oils that you can capture those beautiful details of precious stones, of light going through glass and through water, because oil reflects light. And it, you can create layers of oil with pigments in it that actually show through to the white ground underneath. So everything can kind of shimmer. And you can create very, very precise details that you can't do with tempera, which is what the Italians had been using. Eventually, they'll share all of their techniques together. But at this time, we're going to look at how they use the oil paint to capture and give glory to God by looking at the things of this world. So it's 
a moment to douse the glim. And we're going to begin very early with the Limburg brothers who were from the Netherlands and they were brought to the court of the Duc de Berry, the French court, the Burgundian court, uh, to create books of hours. This would be in a very, very small compass, what we're seeing here. But exquisite detail, miniature detail. You can see down here a swan and a bear. In, uh, in French, a bear is an ours, and the swan is a signe. And the patron saint of the house of the Duc de Berry was Ursine, and his mistress was named Ursine. So you have a little play with ours and signe. And that's why they are right here and here and a little bear here and up, just dotted around to remind the world of the house of the Duke de Berry, patron saint and his mistress. So you have a gorgeous annunciation scene, very Gothic architecture, a very courtly kind of angel Gabriel, his little scroll saying gratia plena, full of grace, hail Mary. We still are using the, uh, the lily as the symbol of her purity and perfection. God the Father holding the, the world up here and the Holy Spirit coming down. She is in her uh, kind of surprised position with her hand raised. She's been interrupted from her reading as we've seen time and again. This is the old tradition. They didn't have any altar pieces at this time except carved ones. That was the tradition in the north because they didn't have the nice dry walls that uh, the Italians had to use tempera on. They had much colder walls and wetter walls and therefore they used tapestries as a form of art rather than uh, tempera paintings and the miniature art that you're seeing here. All that was to change with the um, Brutalum altarpiece, which is an early usage of oil, one of the first, and you, you can see its odd shape. It was built around sculptures. These are the two wings, and so you have four episodes being shown. The Annunciation here, the visitation of Mary and Elizabeth, the presentation in the temple, and then the uh, flight to Egypt. But we're going to major on this one, and you see two forms of architecture, very Gothic here, and then Roman back here, almost like the Pantheon. And in the Northern tradition, that was um, an attempt to show that Mary was kind of at the crossroads between the newness of the Gothic style, we think of it as old, but for them it was the height of modern, and the old Roman form, which was the Old Testament. So she's the bridge between the New Testament of Gothic architecture and the Old Testament of Roman. So often you will see two forms of architecture in the Northern School. This is God the Father who is up here blowing down the Holy Spirit. And you see him surrounded by angels and seraphim who were almost like bird-like creatures covered in feathers. We'll take a look at the angel who is very courtly fashion, kind of bowing in a, in a gesture of courtesy to Mary with, the, of course, the lily right here and his words, Ave Maria, gratia plena, God is with you. She is holding, you can barely see it, but a spindle because Mary was conceived of as being, in, in, in a story that was popular, a priestess in the temple in Jerusalem and responsible therefore with other young women for weaving the curtain annually for the temple. So often she is depicted with needlework or wool, a spindle in her hand. The Holy Spirit's coming down here and once again, we have a chamber because as you saw in the Italian uh, depictions, to convey, convey symbolically the womb and her secret place, there's often a bedroom behind her in a receding area, and that's what that is. 
you can see the perspective is kind of all over the place with lines going off here and here. They're trying to capture it, but they don't quite know how to do it. But they're not too worried about that either, not like the Italians were. You have lights up here, and we'll see this again and again. They're not lit because the light of the world is leaving heaven just now and is about to be born into this world. But for the moment, the light in this world is snuffed, meaning that God is coming in the person of Christ but hasn't quite arrived. So that's this altarpiece. Now we come to a, one of the most famous altarpieces of the Northern School, and it's in the cloisters in New York, so you can see it there by um, Campin, or the Master of Flemal. It's uh, in three pieces, it's a triptych. On the left, you see the donors, uh, who would be wealthy merchants, and enclosed garden that they have kind of entered, which is Mary's enclosed garden, and it's as if they are coming through the door, getting a peek at this Annunciation. And this is Joseph, uh, Mary's betrothed, who is a carpenter, and therefore using the carpentry tools, lovely village scene in back of him. But we're going to concentrate on this very intimate northern scene. This is an image of wealth, uh, of, of comfort and ease. You don't have much of a sense of space. We're, we're warm and enclosed. This is a cold culture, so it meant a lot to be warm, even though it's March 25th, the, the Feast of the Annunciation and springtime. We'll move in a little more. You can see the uh, perspective lines, but they're not right. You, you see the table is kind of coming out at you. So perspective, uh, we haven't mastered yet. We're just playing with it, but that's not the important thing. It's the details. We see a tiny Christ coming in here with the cross, uh, foretelling his passion. This replaces, in this particular altarpiece, the dove. You see a laver, uh, a basin, which is for ritual washing and is another sign of her as a priestess being clean to celebrate the mass together with the towels that would be normal. And you see the coat of arms of this family is up here in the windows. Uh, the candle, you can see, has just gone out. It's a beautiful depiction of the candle going out with the smoke because Jesus is just coming in, the light of the world. And you see a lion here. They're on the four corners of this, the finials representing Jesus as the lion of the tribe of Judah. And you see writing here on the side because writing is all important. Literacy is being fostered. Women are to be reading their devotions. So here's another book of ours. She's reading one in her hands. And there's even a scroll. So many different forms of, of literacy being promoted. It looks like a prayer shawl, but, but it isn't. It really is uh, the kind of ritual towel you would use for washing uh, to prepare for the Mass. This is probably the most famous altarpiece of the entire Northern School. And Jamie and I had the good fortune to see it in Belgium. It's in San Babo Cathedral. And this is what it looks like, the uh, panels, the 20, uh, it's altogether 24 panels. This is the open scene with Adam and Eve. It's the mystic adoration of the lamb, the lamb being Christ, down here. And it would be open like this on uh, feast days and for the celebration of the Eucharist. But we're going to look at it closed because this is what you would see, and you would see an Annunciation scene in the middle. You have uh, the prophet Zechariah and Micah over here, both of whom foretold the birth of Christ. Two Sibyls, the Eritrean Sibyl and the Cumaean Sibyl, who foresaw, foretold the coming of a savior. They also are depicted on the Sistine Chapel. You have what are called Grisai portraits, fake sculptures, if you will, of the two Johns, John the Baptist and John the Evangelist, because the altarpiece has this, John the Baptist was the patron saint of this particular church and town, 
uh, and John the Evangelist wrote of the very subject of this altarpiece when it's open about the adoration of the Lamb and all of the saints bowing down before him saying, holy, holy, holy. So the two Johns are there and the patrons here. So you have kind of th three levels of reality. You have the patrons who are alive in the flesh, if you will, and you have the biblical reality of the angel Gabriel and Mary and then you have a totally other kind of simulated reality. It's simulated human beings, saints done in Grisai. Moving in a little more closely, you get a beautiful village scene there. Receding back here, a strange space between them, really, with a ewer, I mean, uh, that's, yeah, the pitcher and the basin with the prayer, not the prayer shawl, the, uh, <laughs> the towel for the ritual washing, and we'll move in a little more closely to see Gabriel with the lilies making the announcement, and you can't see it terribly well, but in the very old style, there are words coming out of his mouth, Hail Mary, full of grace, and she is saying, and it's upside down so that God in heaven can read it, Behold, the handmaid of the Lord, and the dove up here Move in a little more closely. That's the scene that you see right here. You can see what you can do with oil paint and practically a one hair brush, just the tiniest to, to create little birds out here. And you, online you'd be able to see it, and I've given you a reference for the Ghent Alder piece. There are people in these windows. And believe me, this is just tiny, tiny. This is the, uh, the ewer and the basin symbolizing purity. It's almost like a, a, a still life and a perfect miniature. Back here in the back, you can see the, the vase of Mary with that form that we've talked about symbolizing her pregnant body uh, with water and clear glass being pierced by the light that comes through here and is reflected on the wall. But that's her purity that is giving birth through the Holy Spirit coming through it to Christ. A little more closely, the two of them together without the intervening space, with the dove hovering above her, the attitude of humility and acceptance. It's about 12 by 15. It's huge. Uh, open, yeah, open, it's 12 by 15, so, and it's 24 panels altogether. It was done by the brothers Van Eck. It was begun by Hubert Van Eck, and it's thought that he died midway through and that his brother Jean Van Eck continued the work. And this was one of the earliest uses of oil paint, and it became the rage. This uh, is also by Van Eck, and it's in the uh, National Gallery in Washington. It's one panel of what probably was a polyptic with, with um, two other side panels, but this is the only one that remains. A much more brilliant Angel Gabriel in what are conceived of as being bishop's robes, and this is almost like a sacred space, uh, convent or um, church, and Mary conceived of as almost a priestess. In fact, her gesture, some people have said, is the very one that a priest uses during the mass. So you could see her as kind of the priest of the Eucharist in this particular image. I want you to take a close look down here at the floor tiles. You have David cutting off the head of Goliath, which is a foretelling of Christ's defeat of evil. You have Samson taking down the temple uh, where all the heathen are, and that's the, the legend that it says up here, you know, Samson uh, kills many Gentiles. Down here is Delilah cutting off Samson's hair. 
And you can see the sort of detail that is possible with the use of oil paint, with the brocade and silk, you can almost feel that texture and, and the way that the light is captured in the stones. It's a little closer. You see all of the Philistines off here in their tent and David lopping off his head. Samson taking down the temple. Up here on the wall, high up in the corner, you see it's, this is like the Old Testament. Uh, the temple is crumbling a bit because we're about to enter the new order that uh, comes with the New Testament with the arrival of Christ. Holy Spirit coming and there are seven gold strands coming down. Those are symbolic of the seven gifts of the Holy Spirit. And you have Moses as a baby here in the arms of a slave being given to uh, the princess daughter of Pharaoh and Moses ascending Mount Sinai to receive the Ten Commandments. God the Father with the seraphim symbolically represented in the stained glass. But if, if you look at it online, you'll see the gorgeous marble work, different colors. It's absolutely the height of realism because we want to render things as closely and as precisely as possible. This is Isaac and Jacob depicted in the little rondelles here. So we have the Old Testament giving way to the new. And we have the words of the angel abbreviated, that's what this little sign means above it, that it's a shortening. So it's Ave Gratia Plena. And she, again, it's written upside down and from the right to left. She's replying to Gabriel, that's why it's right to left, but it's to be read by God the Father who is above. We've seen before the, the messenger staff, gorgeous wings with peacock eyes, peacock being symbol of eternity. So the bishop visiting the princess in a sense. So a whole new take on it. This is the stool because God the Father was going to make Jesus' enemies his footstool. So we have the footstool here in brilliant detail and her lilies. So there you have another Van Eck. Van der Weyden was contemporary with Van Eck and was one of the early users, pioneers in the oil technique. Uh, you'll notice that in these northern painters, none of the holy saints and angels have um, halos anymore because we're striving for a kind of realism and an invitation to you as the viewer to put yourself in this intimate scene. We've now entered into a bedroom as opposed to the kind of uh, living area that we saw earlier and then the temple. This is now a bedroom with a warm sort of womb-like uh, bed here with the deep, deep red. We see the outside uh, because it is March 25th, but we'll take some closer looks here. First of all, the gorgeous cloak of the angel. You see back here the ewer and the basin. There's the landscape, closer look of that. I want you to take a look up here because once again, we have the vase in that wonderful shape of a, a woman bearing a child being pierced by the light of the Holy Spirit. We have no candle here because the light has not yet come into the world. And we have here what looks like a pomegranate love apple, symbolic of the fall of, of Adam and Eve's partaking of the fruit of the, of the knowledge, of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And because of that, the holy plan of salvation has to be launched. So all of that is in this very uh, densely detailed picture. Perspective is now being used actually quite well. Van der Weyden had a, a good grasp of it and the, the tiles seem to be receding and the lines here receding properly in space. You'll see up here there are no lights either. The, the, it's a medallion and it doesn't have a particular symbol in it, but it's, 
it shows off the technique of oil the same way as in a, another Van Eck painting, the portrait of the Arnolfini uh, couple, the marriage couple. There's a convex mirror there, and it, it, the mirror shows how oil paint can be used to reflect. So it, it really is kind of showing off, in a sense. This is, is a highly unusual one. Again, it's in the United States, so you can visit it. Uh, I put it here because it's so unusual to be seeing things from an aerial perspective. We are up above, and I've not seen other enunciations like this. We have the traditional elements of the walled garden, which is the symbol of, of Mary's virginity that's being protected. You have the angel dressed as a bishop with the wonderful wings and his staff. You have Mary receiving him in what appears to be something like a temple in her priestess uh, position with the lilies here, Holy Spirit here, and down here it says Regina Kaili, which is the uh, Latin for queen of the heavens. So Mary, queen of the heavens in her blue cloak as usual with the red for the passion underneath. Yes, and I don't know, I, I've, I don't think the columns have the same uh, symbolic significance that the Christ column did in Italianate uh, painting. I think the painters of this time love to create the columns, the illusion of sculpture and of marble. They, they truly love what they've discovered with oil paint and they use it to the max. This is by the same artist uh, but it, it shows two scenes, the Annunciation up here and uh, the Nativity down here, and we're going to focus on the one up above. Again, no halos and much more of an open environment of a, a landscape scene in the bedroom, uh, very airy and light. This is all faux around here, a faux kind of uh, frame. And the Holy Spirit, she is inclining her ear. This is to show that she is attentive and listening to the angel's message. She's just had a reading interrupted, as she's supposed to be a, a good studious uh, uh, devotee of the, the scriptures. And you have her, her vase of lilies here. Moving in just a little closer beautiful landscape and riverscape with the walled garden here. And now Dirk Boots, another pioneer in oil painting technique. We have four uh, illusionistic scenes. You have the Annunciation here, the Visitation, the Nativity, and the adoration of the Magi. This is the only one, as you can see, that's an interior scene because that's the preferred place to have the Annunciation happening in the Northern School. All the rest have images going off into space of a landscape. So we're going to look a little more closely at this. Across the top here, you have uh, God creating Eve from Adam, then you have the snake uh, tempting Adam and Eve, uh, then you have them partaking of the fruit, then they're being chased from the Garden of Eden, they're being clothed, and here you have the killing of Abel by Cain. So a kind of shortened uh, form of conveying the fall and all of the, the consequences from that that made necessary what's happening down below. This again is grisai. It's oil technique used to create the image of sculpture, of the molding. You have back here the apple and the ewer and basin for purity. Her reading's been interrupted. She's in the posture that we know as reflection, uh, the cogitatio. Again, we have lights up here that are not lit for the reason that, that you now know. And it, it's kind of a cross between a bedroom and a holy place with this uh, barrel vault, which would be in a church, and these Gothic windows. So it's, it's an unusual architecture. Memling, who 
is, is far more precious in some ways as a painter. Uh, highly refined technique, very uh, much part of a courtly tradition. You have a lovely landscape out here of her walled garden. You have rosemary plants that are actually in tubs so they can be taken in in the winter. Uh, a potager, a, a kitchen garden with various kinds of fruit and vegetables being uh, raised. A guard here, enclosed space again. You see her handiwork to show that she isn't a lazy person, <laughs> that she's going to be creating that, that veil. She's at her reading as well. The lily beautifully depicted with extraordinary care. And, uh, online you'll be able to see even the grain of the wood. So the oil technique has become incredibly refined by this point. And down here in the uh, carpet and up here are the coat of arms of the family for whom this particular devotional image was made. So that, my friends, is the Annunciation. <laughs>